2024 Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy appeared on Tucker Carlson's Twitter show this week, where they talked all things regarding his 2024 campaign, the Russia-Ukraine war, LGBTQ plus rights, and more. The pair teed off their conversation by discussing 9-11, including Ramaswamy's suggestion that the American government was not fully forthcoming about, about what happened on that day. Here's also Ramaswamy on donations to Ukraine amidst their fight against Russia. I think that's a very good point on both of their parts, talking about the foreign policy establishment. I definitely don't want a candidate that has any perspective other than an anti-interventionist perspective, and that's literally no one who's been a member of the foreign policy establishment. So I think that's a really good point there. Uh, Ramaswamy brings a perspective, I think, to our politics that's similar to RFK in that they're both independent thinkers and they're willing to talk about issues that we see these polished establishment candidates be absolutely terrified to touch with a 10-foot pole. And I think that's a strength he has. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, being willing to admit that the government lied about some of the aspects of the findings from the 9-11 Commission is a very brave thing to do. He's already taken a lot of heat from it. Uh, former Vice President Mike Pence basically accused him of being in grade school when the attacks happened, mentioning that he was on Capitol Hill which again doesn't uh, give us any insight as to whether or not he knows the full truth of the matter or has been willing to talk about it. And it just um, is a, a pattern among our government, uh, particularly in the intelligence community, to not give us the full information of what has happened in regards to these various attacks, whether it's mass shootings like the Las Vegas uh, terrorist attack that happened at a country concert. We still apparently don't have a motive for that individual. There's been a lot of speculation that he was perhaps affiliated with the intelligence community, perhaps unofficially. We also have not received, as Vivek mentions in that interview, the manifesto from the Nashville school shooter who seemingly targeted a Christian school due to their LGBTQ plus identity. And we uh, have been getting changing stories on the Saudi involvement in 9-11. We've been getting changing stories on the JFK assassination. And so I don't think it's unreasonable at all to just point out that when you have a pattern of behavior from a certain group, um, particularly one that's affiliated with the government that is already very untruthful, that they probably didn't tell us the full story about the deadliest terror attack in the United States history. And it's not pro-Taliban uh, pro or pro-Al-Qaeda or pro-anyone besides the United States to demand that the American people get the full truth of what happened. I think the extent to which the intelligence community has decided things of great consequence when it comes to U.S. foreign policy is the greatest threat to our democracy. The fact that we have candidates running simply on declassifying information uh, about what the intelligence community has been up to, about terrorist attacks against the United States, that that can be a key tenant of someone's platform and that sets you so far apart from the other candidates is kind of shocking. And it really describes the extent to which we have the bureaucracy, the alphabet soup of the intelligence community in DC. And it's really not just when it comes to intelligence or the military, it's really every aspect of American governance, but there's such a clear divide between those we democratically elect to serve and those that are career people who are either appointed or apply for the positions they're in and can make decisions that people we elect to serve in government uh, go against what those we elect to serve would like uh, for them to do. When we have the Pentagon withholding information that members of Congress want to release to the public and the people making those decisions at the Pentagon never had to run for public office or either appointed to those positions or came up through the ranks, that's really sad when we think about the state of our democracy. And so to have candidates like Ramaswamy, like RFK Jr., like Marion Williamson, and like Cornell West that are challenging the establishment in the typical way of doing things, that's great. But it's also a problem when the establishment has the keys to the primary process. When they make decisions that are not regulated by typical election laws, that makes me really scared for the fate of these candidates that are extremely popular, that are challenging what Donald Trump called the swamp when he ran, which is still certainly not drained and still making a lot of decisions on behalf of the United States and our foreign policy and the people 
that they never had to run to earn the votes to serve. And do they serve us? I think that's a question as well. But it means a lot that we have candidates that are running and making this central in their campaign. And we only have a couple establishment candidates running this time around. Yeah, I mean, to your point about this divide between the bureaucrats in government and the people who were elected by Americans, it reminds me of during the Trump administration when we had one of these government officials write an op-ed for the New York Times describing what Trump had called the deep state, this effort to subvert so many of his policy positions that he was elected to carry out because these unelected bureaucrats had decided that these were not good for the country. They had single-handedly made that decision on behalf of voters instead of listening to the will of the people. And on the thread of the intelligence community lying to us repeatedly, we just found out, thanks to documents released from uh, Republican Congressman Jim Jordan last week, that FBI Director Christopher Wray lied about the targeting of Catholic churches by the intelligence community. He claimed in testimony to Congress that this was the result of a rogue field office in Richmond, Virginia that had released a memo um, comparing faithful Catholics to domestic extremists and potential terrorists. And it turned out that there were at least two other FBI field offices that collaborated on that memo. So time and time again, the establishment and the bureaucrats who uphold it have repeatedly shown us that they are willing to do anything possible to retain their power and subvert the will of the people who are trying to get their elected officials to carry out certain policies policies that they would think would help them in their lives. I think when we consider how the not the foreign policy establishment, but the CIA directly uh, and the covert operations that they've carried out on behalf of the United States that have led to anti-American sentiment all across the globe. When we think about the overthrow of Mossadegh, the coup of a democratically elected leader in Iran, and the way the CIA handpicked the Shah and put them back in power is absolutely absurd. That's why Iran has anti-American sentiments. It's not that they hate our democracy and they hate our freedom. They directly hate us because our resources and military might has been used to destabilize their country and their region. When we think about, you know, the CIA's operations and arming and training the Mujahideen, who then ultimately became the Taliban, when we think about our support for Osama bin Laden calling him a freedom fighter, and then ultimately the terrorist attacks on behalf of Al-Qaeda on the United States, and then we can, sit, can consider things at home when we think about the Unabomber being the victim of experiments of the CIA on Harvard's campus when he was a student there, and then him ultimately developing some anti-American sentiments as well. Just how much violence can be traced to the CIA and the intelligence community and the covert operations they've carried out despite never running for office to represent us, despite not being accountable to the public aside from these 20 years out declassified documents so they tell us what they've done. This is absurd, this can't go on. And any candidate running for the highest office in the United States that is not calling that out can't be taken seriously at this point. Like to ignore it is to ignore the reality of the consequences of those policies, just allowing this national security establishment to run foreign policy on behalf of our country despite never being elected in a supposed democracy. It's just ridiculous. Every candidate should be calling that out. And to not talk about that and to run for highest for the highest public office today is absurd. Like it should be laughable that candidates like Pence and Joe Biden aren't saying these things. Increasingly, we see in our country that the people who are being attacked the most from the establishment are the people who are telling the most truth. And it's sad that it is that way. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. And so to see this reflexive reaction to Ramaswamy's comments, he also took a lot of heat um, for his stance on funding of Israel. Um, he mentioned that he would like Israel to become independent from American money in the next 10 years or so. And I don't know why that's so controversial. Um, Israel, of course, is a great ally to the United States. Um, but I would think that we would hope for the success of any of our allies that they can function without billions of dollars in American aid, without American weapons. They should be self-sufficient. That should be a goal that we're working towards. And it seems like people are trying to paint him as anti-Semitic now simply because he said that he doesn't want to reflexively give so much foreign aid to other countries, including Israel. 
Uh, it's, it's just more of the same from the establishment, and it's why it's so important to have candidates like Ramaswamy, like Trump, like RFK Jr., because the establishment gets into this hive mind where they come up with these harebrained schemes. There's nobody that is willing to challenge them or that comes from a different perspective because they all go to these elite institutions and go through the same, uh, the same, um, you know, think tanks, the same nonprofits before ending up in government. And they all just come to the same conclusions. And no matter how wrongheaded and how many horrible consequences come out of the decisions that they make, they're still insistent that they're the experts, that they're right, that everybody else who pushes back on them needs to be destroyed. That's what they're trying to do to Ramaswamy right now. I think it's it's not uh, something inflammatory for Ramaswamy to say that we're at a 1776 moment in our country, which he said in that interview with Tucker, Tucker Carlson. And I think what he means by that is what a lot of populist candidates mean when they say we're at a flux point in our country. And it's that the people recognize that the economy and the, the military, the foreign policy establishment, just our government as a whole at the federal and state level, uh, and it includes Congress, it's not just the bureaucrats that are responsible for this, but that the country's been run in a direction that is beneficial for the elites, for the political class, for Wall Street and the investors, for people who have capital and make more money off of that capital, not people who get up and work every single day, uh, that the country's been run for their benefit, not for the benefit of the everyday people. And that was really uh, the intent, if you read a lot of the Federalist Papers, if you read a lot of the writings of the Founding Fathers, was this idea of a government run by and for the people. Did they get things wrong? Did they they write structures into our government that resulted in what we have now, which is a government that greatly benefits the elites? Yes, but we're at a moment where I think a lot of people are ready for us to structurally change things in our government so that there's more power and decision making on behalf of the people and put into the hands of the people. And if that means greater concentrated power to, to local offices and to local economies in the United States, great, so be it. But if things don't change and there aren't candidates that are talking about change, I don't think we're at a place where they can win. And it's ironic that this message is coming from Vivek Ramaswamy, who has a ton of money and is only able to run because he has millions of dollars to fund his campaign. The message coming from someone that the system benefits, I think, goes to show how far gone we are as a country when it comes to the functioning of our economy and our democracy. We'll be back. More rising after this. Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the McCad TV family. Please like and share McCad TV. We love you all. Please support McCad TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.